John chapter 14. I bet you could quote this, couldn't you? Jesus is facing crucifixion. He knows that. But he's given some instruction to the apostles, to the church, trying to comfort them, trying to reassure them, but also trying to guide them. We need, I I hope that when we come to church, we're able to um, accomplish a few things. Number one, to be inspired. That when we leave here, we feel like, wow, I'm glad I went to church. God's really said something to me through His Word today. Inspiration. Number two, I hope that we're challenged. How many of you believe you're doing everything God wants you to do, that you could not improve no matter what? So we need to be challenged, don't we? They challenge to do more. And, and even, um, not just challenged in our works and our efforts for God and inspired, but maybe also warned. Where we take account of ourselves and, and say, hey, I better straighten up. How many of you ever get that feeling in church? I better straighten up. Could I really impress upon you this morning that you don't know and I don't know what's going to happen today, much less what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to stand before God today and I don't know if you're going to stand before God today. We have plans and insurance and burial and all that kind of stuff arranged and our wills written out because we expect, as it has always been, that we're going to die and we're going to leave behind loved ones and treasure, right? (laughs) We're going to leave something behind for them. And they're going to have a service for us and bury us or cremation, whatever your plan is. But we have plans for that because that's the way it's always been. But we don't know when it's going to be. And we don't know if the Lord's going to come back and just take us out. We don't know. Jesus was certain that he was going to die. He knew the appointed time had arrived. He knew the purpose of his death. He knew that he was dying to change the world. That his death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, was going to take away the sins of the whole world those who believed. And he says in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. He's talking to his friends. He's he's about to die. Of course, they're they're not really clued in as to what's about to happen. But he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry. Don't grieve. Don't stress. Don't worry. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus saying that. He said, guys, I know you believe in God. You're Jews. You grew up in this belief, in this faith. You grew up in this system, this order of faith. And you know, you know, creation and the Ten Commandments and the Exodus and all those things. He said, y'all know that. Y'all believe in God. And Jesus says to them, believe in me. He said, trust what I'm telling you. Put your whole faith in me. Don't straddle between two opinions. Don't try to be a Christian and worldly. Don't say, well, I'm hedging my bets. I'm going to pray this prayer and ask God's forgiveness, but I don't really know if it's true. Guys, that's not faith. Faith is saying, I know there's a God. I know there's a purpose to this life. I know that I'm a sinner And I know Jesus died on that cross all those years ago with me in mind. And I know that when he died, he was a sacrifice to pay my penalty for sin. And so I come to God, the Father, and say, Father, forgive my sins through Jesus Christ and make him my Savior. I put my faith in Jesus. He said, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus must be part of your faith if you want to go to heaven. I talk to a lot of people that say, well, I believe in a God. I believe there is a God. I believe in God. What do you believe about Jesus? I don't know. 
What do you believe about Jesus? Well, he's a good man. He wasn't just a good man. He was a great man. He was the perfect man, and he was the God man. He was 100% God and 100% man. And he went to that cross to die for us. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, verse 2, are many mansions. Now, we have an image of that, don't you? Right now, in your mind, think of a mansion. That, now, tell me how many of those you think existed in Jesus' day. A mansion in our mind is not the same as a mansion in his mind. A mansion in our mind is not the same as what the apostles understood. So when you get that picture and you're singing that song, I got a mansion, right? The thing you're thinking about and the thing that he was talking about is not the same thing. Way over in glory. It's not the same. So wipe that out of your theology. In my father's house, what he's saying to us is, there's plenty of room. He said, in my father's house, there's room for you. Isn't that great? There's room for me. There's room for you. What would you think if you got to church this morning and Brother Bob was standing at the door and he says, sorry, you're late. There's no more room. By the way, how many of you have been to church and that was the case? I have. I can remember growing up and chosen uh, in Belle Glade, and we went to church, and if you didn't get there early, you stood up for church. And we might have that situation here before too long when people get back to church. And that'll be wonderful, won't it? And we have plans to expand and do all that stuff, but, I mean, right now I don't need it. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great to have so many people in church that we had standing room only? And... and Whoever's at the door could say, come on in. Come on in. Jesus is saying, in my Father's house, there's room for everybody. Remember I told you last week, Noah built the ark so big by God's design that every person alive could fit on the ark. Wow, that's incredible. Turned out, they only needed eight people. <laughs> room for eight and the animals. But it was big enough to fit everybody in there. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, there's room in heaven for you. There's room in my Father's house for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have said, well, you, but not you. You, but not you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also he said, there's room in heaven, and I'm going to be there, and I want you to be there. Amen. How many of you made plans? Don't raise your hand, but just answer honestly in your heart. How many of you made plans? You're going to heaven. Listen, to, let me remind you, because we might have somebody tuned in, or maybe somebody's still a little confused on it. You don't get to heaven by being a good person. You get to heaven because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I hope that if you got saved, you put your faith in Jesus, that you'll work on being a good person, a better person, a Bible person, a God person. But that's not how you get to heaven. I hope when you put your faith in Christ that you will illustrate to us through baptism that you've buried your past and you're risen to walk in newness of life, but you don't get to heaven through the baptistry. I hope that if you put your faith in Christ and been baptized, that you'll unite with the church and be a servant of God, but you don't get to heaven by church membership. I hope that after you got saved and got baptized and joined the church that you will financially contribute to the work of God through the church, but you don't get to heaven by giving offerings. The man on the cross next to Jesus, when Jesus was crucified, said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus didn't say, let's get down and baptize you, get you united with the church and get you to give some money to the church, get you to do some good deeds and clean up and change your attitude so you can go to heaven. Is that what he said? No, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Why? Because of faith, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe in me. 
My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. A place for you. Isn't that great? You get to heaven and the Lord says, well, I'm going to show you this room. We made this one for somebody else, but he didn't show up, so it's yours. Is that what he's going to say? Not according to the word of God. According to the word of God, he's going to say, this is a place we made just for you. Isn't that something? Why? You see, because he knows us. He knows us better than anybody else. How many of you keep secrets from everybody but God? Because you can't keep secrets from God. We play... We didn't have the Valentine banquet this year, of course, yet. But every year we get in that newlywed game, my wife and I. And, and it proves to the whole church we don't have any idea about each other. Yeah. <laughs> we won last year, she said. We studied. What's my favorite song? What's my favorite movie? What is, you know, boy, we can't get it right. People say, y'all even talk to each other? <laughs> Y'all still live in the same house? But I can tell you one thing. Jesus knows me. He knows there are no secrets. There's nothing I can hide from him. He doesn't just see what I do. He knows what I think. How many of you know that God knows what you think? Because sometimes he makes you hush. You get ready and, and you feel the Holy Spirit just wrap you up and go, Stop, but we better quit. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And then there's Thomas. Thomas steps up and he says, Lord, we know not where thou goest. How can we know the way? Here's the problem with Thomas's phrase with his speech Thomas was thinking local and temporal and Jesus was thinking universal and eternal guys we got to get out of this mindset that Thomas had of just right now and what I can see and touch and reach right now our mindset's got to be heavenly our mindset's got to be eternal what matters well what matters right now is you know little local things Price of fuel, price of food, wages, insurance, medicine, virus, all these little local things. We've got to think beyond that. Because if there's anything I've found out about life is that life changes. If there's anything I've found out is that just because it's this way now doesn't mean it's going to be that way tomorrow. And so we've got to know of a certainty. And we've got to know of eternity. We've got to know about heaven and think about heaven and keep our mind and our focus there. He said, well, the way I, the way, where I go and the way to get there, you know. And Thomas says, Lord, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. Be honest. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. If you don't know, then just confess that. You say, well, I don't know how to get to heaven. Well, then let me tell you. You bow your head right now and you talk from your heart to God's heart and say, God, I'm a sinner and I know that. I know I failed you. I've let you down. I've broken commandments. But I know Jesus died on that cross for my sin. God, I ask you to forgive my sins and save my soul. And God, I give my life to you. That's how you get saved. That's how you get to heaven. By putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You mean I don't have to join the church? You don't have to. You mean I don't have to give any money? You don't have to. You don't have to do good deeds? You don't have to. But when you give your life to God, He's going to change you on the inside. He's going to change who you are. The Holy Spirit of God, the very presence of God Almighty is going to come into you. And you're going to sense God in your life when you pray and ask His forgiveness and put your trust in Him. Jesus is saying to Thomas, look at verse number 6. I am the way. Thomas said, how do we know the way? He said, I'm the way. He said, we don't know where you're going and how to get there. Jesus said, there's only one way. Boys were asking some questions this morning on the way to church about 
faith and religion and all that kind of stuff. And I had to remind them, which they, they trust the Lord, they've put their faith in God, but they're still learning about the world and life. Jesus is the only way. Did I say Baptist is the only way? I didn't say that. I said Jesus is the only way. Jesus says in verse number 6, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And, well, this last phrase just nails it down, doesn't it? No man cometh to the Father but by me. We can't get to the Father by any other way. It's only Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 7. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth you know him and have seen him. Have you been so long with me and yet you haven't figured out that when you see the Son, you see the Father? And so when we look at Jesus and we see his works and we hear his voice and the things that he says, don't we realize that's coming from the Father? That's coming from heaven? That's already in him, but it is coming from the Father? Now let me ask you this. How many people know the Father because they know you? How many have seen the Father through the things that we do? They should. When they see us, when they spend some time around us, they ought to be able to say, I've been in the presence of God. Not because we are gods, because we are not, but because we have the presence of God and the wisdom of God and the guidance of God in our lives. He says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father. So do they know the Father by knowing us? In fact, how many people that know you would be surprised to find out you're a born-again Christian. There was a little plaque in a shoe store, I remember, in the mall. We used to go as kids. I don't remember the whole story, and I've seen it recently, maybe a couple of years ago. But here's the gist of it. When you got to heaven, everybody was shocked you were there. (laughs) What? How'd you get here? Am I in the wrong place? (laughs) That's tragic. That would be tragic for people to be shocked that we were in heaven because they never knew we had put our faith in Jesus Christ. Don't just put your faith in Jesus. Let people see Jesus in you. Verse number 8, Philip steps up. He says, Lord, show us the Father. It sufficeth us. We'll be satisfied if we could just see him. (laughs) What did he just say? If you've known me, you've known the Father. He said, well, we just want to see him. Verse 9, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me? Philip, have have they seen God in us? Have they seen Jesus in us? Through our actions, through our words, through our attitude, do they see Jesus in us? They might know you go to church. Oh, he goes to church up there. But have they seen Jesus in us? I mean your spouse, do they see Jesus in you? I mean your children, do they see Jesus in you? I mean your employees and your boss and your co-workers and your neighbors, do they see Jesus in you? I don't mean do they see religion, I mean do they see Jesus? He that has seen me, verse 9 continuing, has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Is the Father visible in us? Verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. When we look at our our decisions, our actions, our behavior, what's guiding that? What's leading us? Who is leading us? Is it just selfishness? Is it just the flesh? 
How many of you did something this week and you say, that was just the flesh? Anybody? How many of you did something this week and you say, boy, that was God. That was God working. We've got to be able to see the difference in our lives. And, and here's the other question. Which one controls more? The Father in us or the flesh? Who has more control? Because I'll tell you this. I've made some dumb mistakes in my life. How many of you have ever made a dumb mistake? How many of you would say, Preacher, you've made dumb mistakes? Appreciate that. Thank you. We've made, we've made dumb choices. And if it were up to me, all the choices I make, you take God out of the equation, take the Lord and His Word and the church out of the equation, I could royally mess up my life. And when I mess up my life by those dumb decisions, it would mess up the lives of those people around me. But thank God, not only through studying His Word and attending church and trying to serve Him, be a student of God, I've made some decisions that God had influence in. And when I was about to make some dumb decisions, some dumb choices, the Lord stepped in and said, Now, son, you really want to do that. And he's kept me from some really dumb decisions. Our actions ought to reveal God. People ought to see in us the Father. They ought to see in us the Father's truth. They ought to see in us the Father's love. Think about this. The Father loves us so much that He let His Son die on the cross for our sins. He didn't interfere. He didn't stop it. He let it happen. For us, He let it happen. That's love. That's love. To sacrifice his own son who was perfect for a bunch of knotheads like us. Who not only sinned, but even after we got saved, we're still selfish, inconsiderate, ungrateful. Sometimes, I'm not, I hope not all the time. We don't appreciate what's been given for us. That's love. They ought to see in us His love. They ought to see in us His mercy. They ought to see in us His compassion. I, I'll get a little personal here, but there's some decisions that everybody's aware of that we're kind of trying to decide the right direction to go. And every once in a while, something will happen and I'll say, that's it, I'm done. And then the Lord says, is that how you want me to treat you? Whew, boy, that's hard. The Lord said, when I took you, I took you in forever. And if I had thrown you away when you messed up, you'd have been gone a long time ago. Boy, he's tough, isn't he? Can people see the Father in us? Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Have you been so long with me, and yet you can't see who I am? Believe me, verse 11, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or he says, believe me for the work's sake. He said, just look at what I've done. Is it real or not? Is it true or not? He said, now, you know, they sent John. John the Baptist sent some messengers. They came to Jesus. They said, well, John wants to know, are you the real deal? He said, well, just tell them what's happening. He said, tell them the dead are raised and the lame are healed. and The lame walk. Just tell them what's happened. If he can't see that this is the real deal, then I don't know what to tell you. When people look at Capitol Heights Baptist Church, 
when, and, and I say church, I'm talking about us. We are the church, the people are the church. When they deal with us, do they get the real deal? Is it genuine? Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it sincere? Is it godly? Now, by the way, it's not perfect. There's not a single perfect person that's a member of this church. Not a single one. Now, I love you, and I hate to think some of you ever sin. Some of you, I think, you never do anything wrong. I wouldn't be surprised when you walk out here in the driveway this afternoon, you walk on water to get to your car. I mean, that's how much I think of you. But you better carry your rain boots because the truth is the preacher doesn't know everything. He says, believe me for the very work's sake. Verse 12, and we'll finish up here. He says this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Uh Uh-huh. So when they see the Father in Jesus, they need to see the Father in us. But look at this next phrase. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go to the Father. Jesus said, I'm leaving. Think about this. Jesus lived on the earth 33 and a half years. Part of that, he was growing up, right? He was a boy. He was a teenager, all those kind of things. He was growing up. The age of 30, he's baptized. He begins ministry. He starts being a leader, a pastor, a preacher. And he did that for three and a half years. Three and a half years. How many of you have been born again for more than three and a half years? Raise your hand. More than three and a half years you've been saved. Some of y'all not saved, I guess. I've been saved longer than three and a half years. You know what Jesus said? Greater works than these because he said, my time's cut short. I'm going to the Father. I'm going home. His earthly ministry, three and a half years. Think of the people he reached in three and a half years, thousands and thousands and thousands. Now, look, I can't feed the thousands with five loaves and two fishes. I can't walk on water, can't raise the dead. But I've had an opportunity to touch people's lives, to reach people, to show people the Father for more than three and a half years. And Jesus said, greater than these. Greater works than these. So you know what? He's expecting us to get busy. He's expecting us to make a difference. He's expecting us to show them the Father. Let's stand. Father, we do love you so much and thank you for the time that we've had This morning, we pray that you will reach into our lives and make us what you'd have us to be. Father, it's our prayer that they will see you in us, in our behavior, in our words, in everything we do, in our decisions. God, we want them to see you. We don't want to have any glory because it doesn't belong to us. It's yours. So, God, we pray that they will Glorify you by what they know about us. And that will direct them to know you. Father, if there's anyone here this morning without faith that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that right now they'll humble their hearts before you and pray and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Surrender themselves to you. God, we know what we can do with our lives, but we want to see what you will do with our lives. Greater works than these. Wow. God, it's our prayer this morning that you will do greater works through us, with us. Anoint us with your power. Fill us with your love. Make us useful to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar's open if you want to come and kneel and pray or maybe just pray where you are. Jesus said there's enough room in heaven for you. In fact, there is a room particularly for you. And I'm going to go, but I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you, and I'm going to bring you there so you can be there with me. Do they see the Father in us?
Thomas had ideas of local and temporary and Jesus had an idea of universal and eternal. What kind of thinking do we have? Is it just about now? Is it just what can satisfy us, what can make us happy right now? Or do we have a long-term plan? Do we have an eternal mindset? As God's people, we need to. We need to get our minds on heaven and make a difference. Amen. Appreciate your attendance, your attention this morning. Hope you'll be back tonight, 6 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7. The request has been made that you pray it will stop raining. And Lord, that's our prayer, that it stops raining. All right. For just, what, how long? A couple of days? Give us a week off? All right. The sun will come out. Y'all see that pretty picture of a rainbow somebody took as they were driving by the church and sent it to Sister Beth. She sent it to me and so we thought we'd share it with you. Anything else? Thank you again for your love and, and support. Thank you for being my church family for the last 16 years. And I'm glad for those that have been added to our family. It's great to add to our family. We're thankful you're part of our church family. Let's go to the Lord and dismissal prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Andy, would you dismiss us, please?